It's an idea that was launched by a French theorist of complexity called Edgar Morin. And then it was picked up by Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, in 2015-2016 to describe the experience of trying to govern Europe when you had to deal with the Greek debt crisis, Putin's first aggression against Ukraine, and the uh, sort of rumblings of Brexit in the background, and the refugee crisis in Syria spilling over into Europe. So economics, politics, geopolitics, and then the natural environment blowing back at us. And those four things, they don't reduce to a single common denominator, right? They don't reduce to a single factor. Um, and that's why I think the polycrisis term has a real utility, descriptively as much as anything else, because it's kind of hand-waving. Of course, it's kind of arm-waving. It's going, look, there's a lot of stuff happening here all at once. And that precisely is what we're trying to get our, wrap our minds around. If you just read a newspaper or watch the news, in a sense, you are presented with this collage. 
And the collage begins to just look incoherent and crazy to the point where you begin to wonder whether you'll actually sort of be able to any longer trust your own senses. And what the polycrisis concept says is, you know, relax. This is actually the condition of our current moment. Um, and I think that's, that's useful. It's basically a kind of message of kind of relief in a sense. If you've been feeling confused and you've been feeling as though everything is impact on you on the same time, this is not a personal private experience. This is actually a collective experience. And if you've been having a hard time reducing all of this to a common denominator, then, you know, join the club. The unfolding of this current moment starts in 2008, which is simultaneously not just the financial crisis, which we all remember, but also Putin's first aggression against Georgia. It is also the breakdown of the WTO in the Doha round. It is setting the stage for the disappointment of the Copenhagen climate talks. And then on top of everything else, there was a swine flu epidemic in 2008-9. And so in a sense, you already see there many of the elements of the current moment coming together. It's like riding a bicycle. Like riding a bicycle is an inherently precarious thing to do. The bike is inherently unstable. It should fall over. When it falls over, you should get hurt. On the other hand, if you learn how to ride it, it's God's gift. It was arguably one of the most radical inventions of the late 19th century and hundreds of millions of people all the way around the world experienced emancipation because of those two wheels and that chain, right? And so it's fragile, it can break. It's something that came out of nowhere as a piece of invention. It opened the door to all sorts of other things. It requires skill to ride it. And if you ride it badly, you'll end up really badly hurt. And that to me is quite a good image for the challenge of modernity. I get this question asked like, I don't know, like 10 times a week, which is that, look, is uh, conversational AI going to take away jobs? Uh, and my consistent answer is no. And the best analogy I will give to you is um, banks and ATMs. So uh, prior to the technology of ATMs, the most common reason why people would walk into a bank would be to take out money. So imagine there's no ATMs. And 90% uh, of the reason why somebody goes inside the bank is to say, I need to take out some cash or I need to take out some money. As a result, this is, you know, you and I don't even remember these days, but banks used to be crowded, there used to be long lines and so on. Here comes the ATM, which automates really what should be a very simple task. Now today, when you need to go to a bank for more complex stuff, like change of address, close my account, I need a loan. It's such a beautiful experience. Right? There's no lines, uh, you know, the agents or the bank uh, tellers are uh, welcoming, they, uh, they have time for you, they can actually solve your core problems really, really well. Take that analogy to what every single use case, right? which is that uh, those jobs are not going to go away, but rather those jobs are going to get more advanced. Those people are going to learn to do much more complex tasks, which will fundamentally improve all our lives, including creating better just jobs and skills for all these people. AI, by the way, is a field that has been around for, let's say, roughly 60 years now, or maybe 70 years. In the 50s or 60s was when the first time that it when the, was when the first AI program was written. Um, and you know, there was a period which was referred to as the AI winter during roughly the 70s or the 80s. Um, you know, I think now, from here on forward, is going to be whatever the opposite of the AI winter is, which is um, the next 10 or 20 years is really going to be the golden age uh, of uh, AI. If you want to now uh, get things done in a faster manner, uh, you know, it's it's really the most natural form to also engage uh, with some sort of an AI program.
when the internet came out or the smartphone came out you didn't necessarily think so much every day how am i going to make the best use of the smartphone you know uh, entrepreneurs and developers meet that possible for you you know the uh, founders of google created google to make the internet a lot more accessible and easy for you to use similarly the founders of facebook and instagram and whatsapp created those apps for the smartphone and then you just found amazing utility so similarly you know let you know uh, the ai developers of today and tomorrow create those programs apps and companies that will make it much easier for everybody to use it for various use cases and along with that i would encourage every uh, you know uh, budding business person entrepreneur or software engineer to give their own shot at potentially building some of these ai uh, apps and companies um, because the use cases and possibilities are limitless